So I'm Mark Weber, uh, Curatorial Director of the Internet History Program at the Computer History Museum, which is quite a mouthful. I want to thank Professor Wong for inviting me and for his generous hospitality, and Yi Si Liu for making the connection. I am honored to be here and to have been able to welcome some of you to the Computer History Museum. People tend to think of multimedia and hypertext, like the web, as on separate tracks. They're merely two advances that hit the mass public in roughly the same time period. People rarely think of them as deeply intertwined for over 100 years in ways that are sometimes at odds with each other, as we shall see. So the image there is from the plans of one of the pioneers of multimedia, Paul Autlet, for a world city to house the hub of the proposed worldwide network near the site of the League of Nations in Geneva in the 1930s. But first, a little bit about the Computer History Museum. We have the largest general collection of computing materials in the world, including a media archive open to researchers. About 40% of our collection is physical objects. The rest is papers, video, images, software, and data. We've conducted over 1,200 video oral histories. Our permanent exhibition, Revolution, the First 2,000 Years of Computing, was the first to cover the evolution of the online word world in depth. Our software exhibition explores the social role of software as it gets, gets connected and goes online. I was proud to put one of the community memory terminals, which Lee Felsenstein worked on, in Revolution. Most of what I'll talk about today relates to multimedia and hypertext, but we also have a lot of material on the canonical history of interactive graphics, from the PDP-1 restoration, where you can play Space War, to Ivan Sutherland's 1968 virtual reality headset, the first one. Our biggest artifact is our building, built as Silicon Graphics sales headquarters. And the Internet History Program builds on the museum's world-class collection of networking and mobile materials, as well as materials assembled by the earlier Web History Project. Our goal is to preserve and tell the stories of the online world and the people behind it, as well as those who li whose lives are transformed by it, from smartphones to the gig economy. Around a quarter of the museum exhibit galleries are on net and mobile topics. The program also engages a broad audience with live events, publications, and videos. And we're currently working on a chatbots exhibit, which is very topical, um, to open next June. And the, for, the uh, oh, I'm sorry, I did not click, I should have. That's the Internet History Program. <laughs> um, and there's for the chatbots exhibit. So we're not going to show this particular fortune teller automaton, but we're actually going to show one of the same genre. Um, people have been trying to get machines to talk for quite a while. Um, So in terms of graphics, my, my own first jobs were testing paint and draw programs in the late 1980s for Activision, Apple, Electronic Arts. And these were part of a larger trend in tools to let ordinary people produce media of different kinds, from music to video to page design. And that was really part of the personal computer revolution, the idea to, to give people tools. Uh, we preserved these and many other kinds of software. Um, though that access to tools has gone away in many ways with more recent computers, although it's increased in others. So by the early 1990s, multimedia on personal computers was getting surprisingly good, helped by CD-ROM readers. Games were getting really vivid. Hypertext was best known through HyperCard, which could also create interactive CD-ROMs. It was all standalone. These were not networked for the most part, 
but the media future looked very rich. Better and better graphics, sound, um, all those things until the web bombed it all back to the Stone Age. Basically put it back at least a decade. So in 1995, I was executive editor of this experimental many media magazine with partners including The Economist Group, The Guardian, Le Monde, Ad Age, Swiss Radio and TV. It was a huge accomplishment that we could integrate audio clips, very short ones like the microphone icon that you can click on um, into it at all. And my TV interview with Jim Clark was broadcast as video on the M-Bone, which I don't know if any of you would remember, but it, it was about two frames a second, maybe. Uh, that was video over the internet at the time. Um, and the limit was not expertise. The magazine's publisher was the, and, um, was the, the firm that was co-founded by Jean-Francois Graff, who wrote much of the web itself with Tim Berners-Lee. Uh, the limits were about bandwidth and certain choices made as the web grew. Um, but the tension, be, which I'll, I'll, I'll talk about a little bit, but the, the tension between representing content and spreading it around goes much further back. So people have been creating in different media for a long time, from music to dance to cooking to verse. But the fact that language is made up of discrete words made it especially easy to, co to copy quickly and accurately. That also made it ideal to encode in compact symbols starting about 5,000 years ago. So some form factors seem to recur. Uh, to the right is actually a wooden writing tablet covered with erasable wax. Um, but even clay tablets, like the one at left, used cross-references, which you can consider an ancestor of the hyperlink. But the, the point, though, is that words can be represented and copied kind of infinitely without losing uh, resolution the same way that other media are. So while anyone literate can copy writing with very few errors, Copying even simple illustrations requires interpretation and skill. Early printing, too, was designed mostly for text. It took a long time for illustration to catch up. So, for instance, ancient um, Greek and Roman scholars illustrated their text, like Pythagoras with geometry, but most of those were lost when they were copied. You end up with just the text with the images stripped out. And obviously, printing, um, movable type printing, which started in Asia but then became very big uh, with Gutenberg in the West, uh, is not designed for illustration. That's purely for recurring um, characters or letters. So light speed digital communication started in 1837 with the telegraph but it was initially text only. For the first time, 19th century inventors captured images, sounds, and even motion as movies, but that was not going over the telegraph. Aside from the telephone, all of those media required physical transport. They were completely locked. Um, and by the 1920s, information pioneers like Paul Audelet, Henri de La Fontaine, who worked with him on, uh, in Belgium, began dreaming of something like a World Wide Web, or as H.G. Wells called it, a world brain, tied together with a type of hyperlink. But the same completest urge that inspired these visionaries to link all the knowledge in the world also drove some of them to try and include every medium. So not just paper and then and microfilm, which was new and it was the compression, um, compressed media of the time, but telegraphy, telephony, radio, recorded sound, and still experimental television. So at right is Otley's proposed Mondotech, like a um, 
uh, world, it's, uh, it's not easy to translate, but for, um, for the home, which would include a whole bunch of those gizmos on it. You would have, you know, six different kinds of machines to handle different media. And he was convinced that you did need multiple media to effectively transmit knowledge. You can learn from text, but having motion and sound and images uh, gives a much richer experience. Uh, so he and Henri de La Fontaine went a long way to building a working system in Brussels using all the technologies I just described. They were committed internationalists and had enormous faith that shared information would lead to world peace and a general golden age, a dream that recurs periodically amongst pioneers of information technologies. There were some like that around the telegraph, early radio, the web, of course. Um, de La Fontaine also collected feminist literature and pamphlets and was a key supporter of women's rights. And there was a whole world of this between the wars kind of internationalist pacifist activity in Europe um, that this was one expression of. Uh, Autre worked with Le, Cabour Le Cabousier and other architects to plan a world city to be the nerve center of the worldwide network. He planned to locate it near the League of Nations, first in Brussels and then when Brussels lost the bid to host it in Geneva, Switzerland. So they were part of this loose network of information visionaries with pacifist internationalist ideals. Um, and they were also exploring um, the first machine readable medium. So holes in paper film to navigate information. And this goes back to hollow earth card sorters like IBM card sorters, uh, jacquard looms further back. But one of these, sorry. So this is the dawn of automated search. So using machine readable media uh, holes in paper for essentially the intelligence, the computing that would go on in information search. And Emmanuel Goldberg um, worked at Zeiss Icon in Germany, uh, headed their research lab, and they were doing early television, they were working on micro dots. But we, we think of automated search as being a recent thing, but he pioneered search using photocells and punched 35 millimeter film with microfilm pages. So you can enter a numeric code, kind of like a URL or a web address, and it would bring up in a few seconds the page that corresponded to that on your, your screen. And he even built it into his desk at Zeiss Icon like a workstation. And in the same period, two of the fellow travelers with these kind of ideas, uh, Wilhelm Ostwald, who was a chemist, I think a Nobel laureate, uh, was building something called the bridge in Germany to standardize all sorts of formats, share information. Um, H.G. Wells, the science fiction author, also wrote a book called World Brain, where he proposed a very similar set of ideas and went around evangelizing these. Um, both were very, you know, confident that sharing information could bring about peace. Um, but the Second World War erased knowledge of most of this work. Uh, ironically, bits, the bits that came to English-speaking computer pioneers were really only through Vannevar Bush's Memex concept, which was a kind of microfilm web browser that expanded on uh, Goldberg's search engine. So Goldberg was doing essentially one screen where you could enter a set of numbers and come up with a page, like a URL, but there was no ability to link between. So the Memex, you have two microfilm readers next to each other, and you could create links between them. So it's a, it's a big jump in the idea. Um, but Bush was a father of the Manhattan Project, the, the atomic bomb effort in the United States. 
and uh, one of the heads of military scientific, scientific research in the United States. So, you know, you have these very similar ideas coming from very, very different um, people with very, very different goals. And, you know, it, it can seem paradoxical, but I think there is actually a common kind of willingness to push into new frontiers, to push boundaries between um, idealists and military researchers. And I think there is, you know, there's an element of um, what people were talking about yesterday, that there can disruption, there's a commonality to disruption. But I would argue that, you know, the goal is still very important. Many kinds of people want to disrupt the social or technological order, but what they're trying to solve for actually is quite important. <laughs> There's a very different set of goals. Um, so, but certainly we'll see as you move into the, uh, the 1960s in Silicon Valley that, you know, there's a common kind of courage to explore new ideas um, on both sides that, you know, is intention but was also potentially creative. Um, so, start, so all, I showed you all the pre-war, you know, Paul O'Dley, H.G. Uh, Wells, all these ideas of combining media involved lots of equipment, complicated, finicky, heavy equipment. Um, starting in the 1950s, Doug Engelbart, Ted Nelson, and others realized that you could do something like the Memex, which was meant to be on microfilm, but using the digital computer. And that you could do it all in one machine. And Claude Shannon, the father of information theory, had even proven that ones and zeros, bits, could represent any medium digitally, which was not clear before. It was not, I don't think it was obvious to someone in the 1920s or 30s that you could use the exact same storage for all of these different media and mix and mingle them into one kind of omnimedia. So although they didn't know of Paul Otley, um, pioneers quickly began dreaming of linking multiple media. So Ted Nelson actually started with video hypertext ideas. His, he was interested in film and he wanted to have films that would link to other films through particular places. Uh, Doug Engelbart and Andy Van Dam, uh, the latter of whom had turned to graphics um, early on, tried to cram in as much graphical capability as they could into these very limited computers at the time. So the, the tension here is that they are thinking of using the computer to combine all media, but a computer at the time had almost no memory and no ability to display even simple graphics, very limited ability. Uh, there, by the way, there, Doug Engelbart uh, at the custom workstation by Herman Miller that he used in the mother of all demos that, that Lee referenced. Uh, and we have a reproduction of this at the museum done by some of the original people who worked on it. Um, Andy Van Dam kept on with more and more multimedia-oriented hypertext. Uh, this is from the 70s, a mock-up of a visual hypertext system for technical training. But computers through this period were very limited for multimedia. So they were infinitely flexible, but their resources were limited. And we have a number of examples of the kind of awkward in-between period when people were trying to get computers to do more than they could uh, with the, the memory and processing of the time. And they were mixing analog with digital. So this is from the, these were aperture card from the uh, actually pre-computer era, but into the 60s and 70s and even the 80s. I believe some of uh, Apple Computer's early blueprints were done on these. Um, so you have an, a you know, an illustration like a blueprint in microfilm on the right, and this card can be sorted in a computerized card sorter to find the right image. 
So it's a way to track a library of images, but the images are not in the computer. They're on this little uh, separate piece of microfilm. And so here's the IBM 1360, which was stored data chemically, and it could store enormous amounts of data used by the CIA amongst others. Um, you know, this was tremendously powerful, but again, analog. It's not actually digital the way the data is stored. The Plato 4 education terminal had a flat touch screen in 1974 but for Im this image is actually microfilm projected on the screen. It could control a microfilm reader inside the terminal. They also had audio in a similar way uh, with a magnetic audio disc. The Aspen movie map, um, early 1980s, um, what became the Media Lab at MIT, um, hooked up an analog video disc. These were originally created for video to a mini computer. So it's basically Google Maps with Street View, and we've showed it in our exhibit on that, but using this analog video disc controlled by a computer. Apple's Visual Almanac controlled a video disc player from a Mac. And this is... Um, from a show and tell we have in the collection. So you had an entire encyclopedia on the video disc. But not everyone thought connectivity did not mix well with hypermedia. Some dreamed of interactive television over broadband and Hyper-G, system de developed in Austria there, was hypermedia for the internet. Intermedia, at right, was um, running over local area networks with powerful uh, multimedia in the 1980s. But these were exceptions and running over networks that were not available to most people. So Tim Berners-Lee, um, when he came up with a web with other people, Robert Caillou and others, it was Tim's idea, uh, planned all kinds of ambitious media for his World Wide Web system and it would be handled by format negotiation and MIME. Basically, it would adjust to whatever kind of machine you were on. Uh, if you had a powerful machine, it would show you beautiful graphics or sound or movies. If you had a very simple terminal or a mobile device, it would sort of downgrade it automatically to show you what it could. Uh, but he didn't have time to add those to this demo um, browser on the next machine. This is the first browser, which was also an editor. The web was meant to be much more interactive. And with a very little funding, he asked volunteers to make Unix browsers. Uh, that was the platform that he needed to get out. He also asked them to add flexible multimedia. But the most successful browser, Mosaic, quickly added bitmaps, and only bitmaps, in a way that made it very hard to embed other media. So it basically froze a very limited graphics capability into the web for a number of years. But the images definitely attracted people and made the web, help the web succeed over rivals like Gopher. Um, at the same time, the virtual reality markup language community was pushing 3D web browsers in a wave of optimism. And virtual CAD systems like Venus at CERN, which was uh, shown here used to um, develop particle accelerators, were very successful on high-end equipment. Uh, this was for people that had high-speed lines and very expensive workstations. The average person on the web had very, very limited multimedia at that time. But eventually, online multimedia caught up, both from broadband and from better compression in the form of MP3, uh, broadband connectivity like um, ADSL and uh, cable, and flash music. So these were popularized by Napster and other musical pirate sites, by adult sites for flash, um, but it finally brought 
basically by the late 1990s, the web was up to the level of multimedia on a standalone machine, maybe in the mid-1980s. So it took quite a while. And a number of the people that, certainly Ted Nelson, Doug Engelbart, um, were approaching hypermedia from a counterculture uh, point of view, that they were really hoping, again, a little bit like Paul O'Dley and people in the 20s and 30s, hoping to improve the world by sharing knowledge and with a real faith that that um, would be effective. Um, and I wanted to show that the, so this is, so counterculture in the Bay Area, um, you know, the 60s, 70s is the most famous period, clearly. But this is actually from the Cacophony Society, which is the organization that uh, launched Burning Man in the early uh, 1990. Um, this was a strange confluence of, you had virtual reality, you had Timothy Leary, uh, Stuart Brand, and the Cacophony Society doing this event in, um, 1990 with early virtual reality. And that the connection between counterculture, um, people around Burning Man, and the computer industry continues. It can be, um, you know, there's every type of person involved. Uh, and certainly you can have it as a kind of exclusive club for captains of industry in Silicon Valley, but there's also people with a whole set of different goals. Um, today, online multimedia has finally caught up, technically, to what you could do with a CD-ROM many years ago, but now in a network of four billion people. But the question I would pose is, have the applications uh, Zoom is a realization of a 100-year-old idea of video conferencing and a 50-year-old reality. That's video conferencing imagined by Paul O'Dley at Wright in the 1930s, very similar to what people do now, and demonstrated by Doug Engelbart in The Mother of All Demos in 1968. So the question is, you know, um, what are we going to imagine next that we finally fulfilled? <laughs> we can mix any medium online instantly, cheaply, at very high resolution. But what are we going to do with it? And I think a, a real wild card, of course, is generative AI, where most of the hypermedia pioneers had been imagining combine, you know, a human being picking and choosing all sorts of media and combining them into some kind of omnimedia presentation. But generative AI, as um, one of the speakers was saying yesterday, it breaks things down into these little fragments, almost these packets of either speech or images, and recombines them. And I would argue that it's, um, it's just bringing in a whole other factor, which is that the, the AI is generating or making a number of the, the decisions. It's more like a, an interaction between the person and this almost channeled collective unconscious of imagery or words. Uh, so it's a technique that's more like selectively breeding than designing something. It's more evolutionary that somebody, as the artist was saying yesterday, choosing amongst many, many images that the AI generates is quite different than imagining something and making it so. And I think the contrast is, um, you know, there's an older vision of brain-computer interfaces that in the future you would be able to literally imagine a scene in your head and have it appear on the screen or imagine music. Um, that, that would be much more direct control than generative AI, because generative AI, you bring in that other party, which is the AI, that's mixing things in ways that you may or may not want, and that you're having a dialogue with. 
So I think it's, it's an interesting uh, next chapter in this kind of bringing together of all media, mixing them, and um, figuring out what to do with them. Thank you. Thank uh Yoigodon 我们可能也只剩下一件 古老的这种玩意儿，所以它可能又会重新有一种商业价值出现。然后另外一种就是像像这种你们这种专业的机构去保存，它就可能只保存在全球某一个地方，只有一个孤品。这是一个问题。还有一个问题是想问一下私人，
experts on it from the time, and they show people what you do with it. Because if any of us, including me, just walks up to it, I mean, it takes punch cards in, pun, uh, give, prints out results, well, Lee might know how to, uh, <laughs> to interact directly with it. But, um, you know, it's a mystery to the average person. So I think it's really, you want to show videos and demos for most things that are not self-evident like a game. And the hardware should generally be demonstrated rather than just turned over. I don't know. Lee. Um, this brings up uh, the idea of the computer and cultural context and how that has changed. Uh, it's a very big field, and I don't expect that, you know, we could rough out a plan for it in a few hours. It's going to take years, I think. But I think that would be a very interesting um, direction for the, the Computer History Museum. After all, history uh, has to be seen in context to be understood. And while you can have all, all, the, all of the best display uh, furniture, you don't learn much about how the why they were designed the way they were, and what people did, and what difference it made in their lives. So allow me, if you will, to complicate your task by many orders of magnitude by throwing this suggestion into the pot. I'd like to know whatever, what it sounds like to you. Well, I, I think the, it depends whether you're talking about on, in person, or off site. So what I've said in, other contexts is, you know, on the floor of an exhibit, people have, if you don't get their attention within about 30 seconds, maybe a minute or two, you've lost them. It has to be bite-sized, self-contained. On the other hand, at home, with their own machine and an emulator, the people who are interested can explore and actually explore older systems. Um, so I think it, it's which context it's in, and a museum can provide both. So, for instance, right now, the, the Internet Archive provides lots and lots of older games emulated that you can play. You're obviously not going to experience the original hardware, the look and feel, the smell of it, but it's something that you can do at your leisure. Whereas, to give someone an ancient machine working and no time to explore it doesn't serve much purpose. Um, so it's a, it's a very, it is a very complicated question which we've wrestled with. And for instance, for the chatbots exhibit, we're probably going to do videos of people demoing even current systems, like a chatbot for therapy, a chatbot for uh, customer support, things like that. How do you, if you let people play with it, a lot of them are just going to, you know, get lost in some instruction, or for instance, we tried. We have a Wikipedia exhibit where there's a terminal. You can go up and edit Wikipedia. The whole point is Wikipedia is something anybody can edit, right? People did that. They put up all sorts of horrible things, and now that IP address is banned by Wikipedia. <laughs> because you, if people really are free to play with things, they play in many different ways. Hi, Mr. Weber. Uh, I have a question about the HCI. Uh, do you think the HCI, uh, the human computer interface, is uh, reaching, reaching their end? Because in 1960, we have the video terminals instead, uh, teletypewriters become a major uh, human computer interface. And uh, until today, we still have the a keyboard, a, di a video display as our HCI, a human computer interface. Uh, like the, the alternative way, like the uh, like VR, VR headset, it's developing from the 1980s and got a lot of in, uh, investment in the uh, 2010, in the past 15 years about. Uh, but still, it cannot install the uh, traditional HCI, like a keyboard and a video monitor. 
um, and the, uh, the only thing a little bit changed is uh, the handheld devices. Uh, when we get the, the first uh, PDA, like the, uh, the Palm Pilot in 1996, and uh, until today we still have a handheld device, a touch screen, uh, uh, big icons. It seems almost the same to the very early Palm Pilot. So do you think the human computer interface is already reaching the end as today? Thank you. Well, I hope not. Um, but I, yeah, I think we're, this is a typewriter, basically, which is now 150 years old, almost. A screen or a piece of paper above a keyboard. The, the whole history of mobile is actually how, to, how do you get something that is not with a big screen and an easy way to enter data to do something useful. And it's worth remembering that um, these now no longer have either a pen, like the Palm Pilot, which you could write fairly quickly and accurately when you got good at it, or the thumb keyboard, like the old Blackberries. The soft keyboard is actually very hard to accurately use. So these have become, since the iPhone and Android really um, followed the same model, they're maximized for browsing rather than creating. And that gets back to this thing of like the early web was meant to be participatory. This is a browsing, it's a broadcast receiving machine rather than a way to create. And that's part, I think, of why we do, you know, Twitter and kind of microblogging has taken off partly because it's not that easy to write long form on, on these devices. And actually John Markoff, the journalist and author, wrote, um, when we did an iPhone anniversary at the museum, he wrote an article uh, for us called The Downward Gaze, meaning that if you think about it, why are we constantly looking down at our phones and crashing and you know tripping? Because we need to look to type. With the older thumb keyboard, people got extremely good at blind typing, also with mobile phones. So we're probably spending 60% of our time on a phone staring at the screen to make sure we've accurately entered the text. So that's just one example, I think, of how HCI, those decisions are tremendously important. They're far from over. Uh, the humor magazine, The Onion, had a great article, which I've quoted, that uh, we spend, what is it, studies show we spend 80% of our time looking at glowing rectangles. So we wake up in the morning, we pull, go to the side, and we pull this little glowing rectangle, the phone. Then we go to work, we look at a bigger one, and we come home at night and we relax with an even bigger one. <laughs> and it's like, where, why have computers not broken out from the confines of screens? People have talked about tangible computing and text on walls and smart paint and all of this for decades, but where is it? We're still staring at these tiny little rectangles. So I think there's a lot of the wide open territory there. Uh, hi, thank you, Mark. Uh, I have a, a pretty long question, and I, I, I wrote it. Uh, just let me read it about uh, hypertext. And uh, you mentioned that, and I was thinking that hypertext was really important during the uh, transition of uh, personal computing to network computing uh, during the 90s and maybe the uh, 2000s. And, but in a sense, hypertext uh, is in a strange situation of being the genre that has been most written about in the field. But uh, it seems that simultaneously that the genre uh, least actively pursued by writers today. And uh, instead of uh, as a, it is as a specific genre in its own right. Elements of hypertext has opened up to uh, like new forms, like new mediums, uh, and some essential uh, aspects of hypertext are present in many contemporary genres of electronic literature, like some VR works or some uh, interactive fictions. Uh, but uh, I would like to ask. Uh, what is the importance of hy hypertext today? And uh, I, I remember a quote from Robert Coover. He used to say that 
never forget uh, how interesting it is to read electronic literature. So is it interesting, is, is it still interesting? Because it seems like we, uh, reading, reading news online is like we are reading fiction. So hypertext uh, fiction or hypertext, uh, will it simply be just an archive thing? Or is there anything more interesting or something, uh, or some more possibilities of hypertext itself? Thank you. So the, and actually we've interviewed Robert Coover uh, for the museum, but the high kind of creative writing in hypertext has remained more of a as kind of side genre. But I would argue that we're using it, you know, again, almost anything we do on the web, we're using hypertext constantly. It's the way we access news, reference information, obviously social media. So, I mean, it's, it's such a fundamental part of the way that we navigate content that I don't think it's gone away at all. It's true that books have remained fairly traditional. Uh, although even then, you know, if, when you read a Kindle book, you're often jumping to a definition or something else without even thinking about it. But the, the original idea of these choose your own adventure books where you choose the, you create the narrative have not taken off so far as books but I would argue that in games they have to some extent. You have games where you're effectively shaping the narrative by your actions. I mean, hypertext, again, there's, not, there's hypertext and there's hypermedia. People like Ted Nelson were looking much more to a hypermedia with video and other forms, other media. And we have, you know, if you look at modern games and using the web today, it is all hypermedia. So I think it's there. I personally, I, I think there's a mental kind of effort. When you read something for entertainment, you don't necessarily want to make decisions. You want, that, you want to listen to a story. You don't want to create a story. So I think there's a tension. You know, movies, for instance, there's no technical reason that you cannot have a hypertext, a hypermedia movie where you simply make a decision and put the plot into a different direction. But that hasn't taken off. And I would, my guess, and it's purely a guess, is that's because people want to sit back and be passive in that context. They don't want to choose their own adventure when they're relaxing on their third screen of the day after the first two. <laughs> but um, but hi, it's worth, the hypertext link, though, has become with AI, both the older form of machine learning for on the web and now uh, generative, you know, a link is no longer just a link. It can be all sorts of complex calculations going on in your interest or someone else's. So it's creating a truly dynamic medium. Uh, hypertext gone, has gone far beyond sort of a, a static pointer, which is an old fashioned link. So I think it's, it's all around us. Uh, but that particular form of literature has not become uh, mainstream, that's true. I don't know if I answered it. Well, thank you very much for your